Good evening. My name is John Hare, and from 2005 until 2016, I worked as a U.S. Forest Backcountry Snow Ranger at the Vail Pass Winter Recreation Area. This is my glamour shot from 10 years of working there. Yeah. And this one. This position allowed me to spend about eight months per year working, hopefully in the snowpack, to manage the daily operations and to invest my energy in the community collaboration necessary to connect the Vail Pass Winter Recreation Area across its large geographic span and its diverse user groups. In the USFS Snow Ranger position, I work to develop trusting relationships with coworkers, outfitter guides, community members, and many thousands of winter recreationists that I interacted with over the course of a decade. In addition to collecting fleet fees, plowing snow, and patrolling the backcountry on a snowmobile, I was given the opportunity to learn from a diverse group of winter users. In my opinion, together, the Forest Service and the public, we sought to manage the area to be responsive to the established and long-term users, as well as the new and developing pursuits in the winter backcountry. At the core of my professional experience working at Vail Pass was a sense of the Forest Service implementing a winter travel map where the boundaries have been decided by the local community and the agency's role was to provide the education and the enforcement to support the map. During my tenure in the area, I spent many days in the Vail Pass area on skis, snowmobiles, getting towed all over the place by a snowmobile on my skis, cat skiing, hut trips, hiking, camping, hunting, picnics to see wildflowers with family. I loved working in the area as much as I loved playing in the area. In 2016, after 10 winters working at Vail Pass, I accepted a position on the GMUG National Forest and now work out of Grand Junction where I work to administer reservoirs and water, power lines, pipelines, communication sites, oil and gas, research, and mineral materials on national forest land. Tonight, I'm fortunate to present to, with you and share with you my knowledge of the Vail Pass Winter Recreation Area. The VPWRA, as you'll hear me refer to it throughout this pre presentation, is a 55,000 acre winter recreation area managed by the Forest Service in cooperation with the Vail Pass Task Force. The area is comprised of a 50 mile groomed motorized trail system, five trailheads, eight permitted outfitter guides, four huts in the 10th Mountain Division Huts Association system, and shared boundaries with Vail and Copper Mountain ski areas. The groomed trail system includes several areas where groomed trails are managed for hybrid skiing opportunities. In case you have not heard of this term before, hybrid skiing and riding is where snowmobiles or snowcats are used to transport skiers and riders to the ridgeline on a designated groomed route. The surrounding terrain is then designated as non-motorized so that after being dropped off at the top of the mountain, snowboarders and skiers can ski the fresh powder as they make their way back down the hill to establish pickup areas where motorized is waiting for them. This is an example of a uh, Queen Bee Barbecue Bowl. Sits up near Ptarmigan Pass. As you can see, there's a sort of a really solid white line heading right up the middle of that terrain with ski tracks coming down on each side. This is an example of hybrid terrain where we're grooming that route up the center. We have groomed routes across the top of the bowl and established pickups down here at the bottom where there's room for people to kind of get off their snowmobiles, snowcats to turn around. It's a very unique function of the area. Uh, there are folks up there who may ski four laps in this terrain. There are folks up there who may get 30 backcountry laps in one day in this type of terrain. It is definitely made to facilitate backcountry powder riding. The Winter Recreation Area also supports four huts in the 10th Mountain Division Huts Association and eight different outfitter guides offering services such as cat skiing, snowmobiling, 
backcountry skiing and snowboarding, hut trips, and the most popular guided activity at Vail Pass is avalanche education. This is an example of uh, mixed use on our groomed trails, a guided snowmobile trip passing a cut, hut skiing trip right after they picked up their skiers. This is an airy class looking at snowpack in the area. The Vail Pass Winter Recreation Area is an economic driver for the surrounding communities with close to 50 people working in the area who are mostly guides and the area also provides a steady supply of work for snowmobile mechanics in the surrounding three counties. Those of you who ride know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Since 1981, there has been an ongoing community effort to manage the Vail Pass area for multiple uses, despite the competition for the same precious commodity, powdered snow conditions. Of all the delicacies in the state of Colorado, Colorado, the fresh snow in this area is impossible to put a value on. Effort, early efforts to manage the area were motivated by user conflict in the backcountry and at trailheads between motorized and non-motorized user groups. In 1990, the Vail Pass Task Force, a volunteer citizens task force, comprised equally of motorized and non-motorized users, began a partnership with the U.S. Forest Service to manage the Vail Pass area to provide a high quality experience to all users. The task force is comprised of interested community members, nonprofit representatives, outfitter guides in the area, owners of huts, backcountry advocates, as well as snowmobile club representation. The Vail Pass Task Force has done most of the heavy lifting to establish the boundaries in the Vail Pass area, as well as to create the administrative functions to receive money from the Forest Service, from the state of Colorado, and from private donations. And then take that money and invest it back into the operations of the area, sometimes more efficiently than the US government can. As far as a working relationship with the U.S. Forest Service, generally, the findings of the Vail Pass Task Force are presented to the USFS as management recommendations. And in the spirit of collaboration, the USFS has implemented nearly all of the task force recommendations concerning the operation management and the formulation of the area boundaries with, that are within the agency's ability to do so. The beauty of these task force management recommendations is that the proposals are worked on collaboratively with the Forest Service long before formal recommendations are made to the agency. The conversation begins in the idea phase between the task force and the agency and is continued in quarterly task force meetings. Throughout the development of proposals, the Forest Service is there to provide guidance on laws and policy. This has allowed the Vail Pass Task Force to generate a long list of recommendations that have been successfully implemented by the U.S. Forest Service in the area. The willingness to have a close working relationship with land managers and the U.S. Forest Service has given the Vail Pass Task Force an upper hand to create action items that make their area better on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the hallmarks of the Vail Pass model is the map of the area. The map is printed annually and distributed for free at all trailheads to each visitor of the area. This investment puts all users on the same page about where the terrain designations are, gives etiquette and avalanche safety information, and has been instrumental in many groups' ability to successfully navigate the area. As a land manager and forest protection officer, I found the map to be one of our best tools for winter recreation management. In the course of my job duties, if someone claimed to not know the boundaries, I was able to ask them to produce a map or give one to them right there in the backcountry. 
And I would work with them to develop an understanding of where we were at in the terrain and where the boundaries were in relation to us. I would then continue to try and have a conversation that gave them depth and knowledge about why that boundary was there and why it was important to the task force in the Vail Pass area that we were respectful of it. The management and additional services provided to winter recreation at Vail Pass are funded by a per person user fee that has been collected since 1998. 20 years now that we've had a fee to go skiing or snowmobiling at Vail Pass. Fee collections began each winter on the Friday after Thanksgiving and continue until the fourth Sunday in April. Fees are $6 per person and per day and $40 for a season pass with no charge and change in cost since 2004. This winter, the area is expected to see over 50,000 visitors with fee collections totaling over $200,000. This is a picture of the, uh, the front door to the Vail Pass Winter Recreation Area. This is the first thing you see when you get off of I-70. This is my office for 10 years. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, uh, you know, also costs money and, and takes effort and labor is to have these type of trailheads and having people going there and maintaining them and managing the incoming fees. Uh, a real benefit this winter is that the Vail Pass Winter Recreation Area just obtained money to install an Iron Ranger, which will be a credit card machine right in front of this that you can swipe your card. So, be a real service to that community. This is a, uh, see how well this shows up. Yeah, this is the spreadsheet that shows the, uh, the user numbers and the revenue generated by the area over the past several years. Uh, what's important to note of all these numbers, trending upward. And that, and that trend is expected to continue well into the future, especially here in the state of Colorado. The user fees collected for the area are spent on trail grooming, trailhead snow plowing, and the funding that is left over is used to assemble a staff of seasonal and volunteer forest service snow rangers. The snow rangers primary job duties are to patrol the area, to manage parking on weekends and powder days, to post and maintain signage in the backcountry, to enforce boundaries, collect fees, provide education on weather, avalanche, and backcountry etiquette, work with outfitter guides, avalanche courses in the Colorado Avalanche Information Center, maintain relationships with partners, permittees, and users. Additionally, the snow rangers provide many soft rescues of people struggling in the winter environment. Not everybody realizes, but these soft rescues prevent the volunteer search and rescue groups from mobilizing from their day jobs to come out into the winter environment to rescue people in danger or in trouble. We also recognize that when things are really bad, it's time to call in the pros. And the Forest Service is also the first group to use the local search and rescue groups whenever we have an issue. So, we provide a lot of soft rescues at Vail Pass as a crew of snow rangers, but we also uh, know when to step back and call 911 and have the search and rescue groups come to uh, provide a higher level of assistance. Regardless, after 10 years on the job, I can attest that the list of duties for snow rangers at Vail Pass always seems to be growing. The area is very busy, especially on weekends and powder days. The Vail Pass Trailhead will have 80 to 100 trailers parked there by 10 a.m. On, on a busy day, with 40 uh, cars in the skier parking lot. That's not to mention the interstate traffic that must pass through the Winter Recreation Trailhead to get down to the CDOT rest area, creating a very volatile situation where you have heavy trucks with chains, coming right through an area where people are unloading snowmobiles and walking in ski boots. Despite having a major interstate corridor running through the heart of Vail Pass, 
The VPWRA still offers incredible opportunities to snowmobile up to 100 miles in a day, to spend time near dangerous avalanche terrain far from the closest road. It provides the opportunity to ski alpine peaks adjacent to a groomed route. It also offers the opportunity to venture even deeper into the backcountry. At the end of the day, the capacity of Vail Pass Winter Recreation Area is limited to the number of parking spaces at the trailheads. This number actually fluctuates on any given week, depending on the latest snow cycle or the latest flurry of CDOT front end loader and snowplow activity. There is no firm carrying capacity because it changes with the snow load and how effective we're being at removing snow from our parking areas. Couple of views of, uh, this is looking back at the Interstate 70 corridor from the top of uh, Univa Peak. And this would be looking the other direction from Jacques Peak above Copper Mountain back towards uh, the west and over towards Vail and the Gore Range. Some interesting caveats about the Vail Pass Winter Recreation Area. The Vail Pass Winter Recreation Area is indelibly connected to the Interstate 70 corridor. The interstate provides dependable access to winter backcountry terrain at 10,000 plus feet, despite being a volatile roadway with closures, traffic jams, and accidents that can change throughout the course of the day. The Interstate 70 right away does provide a great opportunity to partner with CDOT on trailhead snow removal. Up on Vail Pass, there's a CDOT sand shed where they store snow plows and front end loaders. For my first five years working there, we had an unpredictable and constantly changing relationship with CDOT. And what really turned the tides in that relationship was when Winter Recreation decided to help itself. And we took some fee dollars one year and we purchased a snow plow. And we started doing some snow plow work on our own with four service guys pushing snow out of the truck. And, uh, the commitment by winter recreation users to help with plowing, it opened the door for a much better relationship with CDOT. The understanding also recognized that interstate traffic on I-70 would always be a priority for CDOT over Vail Pass. But it gave us a clear understanding of CDOT priorities and what were acceptable requests to them for help in our parking lots. Additionally, the CDOT webcam gives users a quick and up-to-the-minute update of road conditions and the latest snowfall. For some time, they had a camera focused on the winter recreation parking lot up there, but I just noticed that recently the angles has changed and you can't see down the parking lot anymore, which is unfortunate. I may have to write them a letter. The VPWRA's proximity to Eagle Valley, Summit County, and the Colorado Front Range communities means that it's full of folks who live in the area for the winter sports opportunities. It is common to hear new users of Vail Pass describe progression of moving to Colorado, skiing and snowboarding at ski areas until they run out of things to do inbounds. <laughs> Then they decide they want more powder in their life and they go buy a snowmobile and they go hybrid skiing at Vail Pass. I often refer to Vail Pass as the bunny hill for folks who just got their first snowmobile and want to go hybrid skiing. The Vail, Prox the Vail Pass Winter Rec Area also has a proximity to, strong, to a strong group of mountaineers, professional skiers and riders, avalanche professionals, industry representatives and educators which makes the area a network hub for many snow-related topics, as well as a destination for avalanche trainings. Vail Pass history is rooted in winter operations, with the U.S. Army 10th Mountain Division training in the area when our country needed it most. The Commando Run, which is a ski route from the Vail Pass Trailhead to the town of Vail, was used as a long-distance ski mission for 10th Mountain soldiers 
and today sits in a designated non-motorized area. This non-motorized designation helps to protect the historic ski opportunity that about three to five groups per week still take on as the 10th Mountain Soldiers once did. Although today we wear Gore-Tex and fleece and they wore wool. Camp Hale is where the U.S. forces were fed and housed as they trained in, the winter, in winter warfare tactics in the surrounding Alpine terrain. It's a strong legacy of the U.S. military here in Camp Hale, both for good and bad. Camp Hale is the troops who, were, who trained here went on to Europe to defeat the Nazi, the Nazi forces in the European Alps. And it's still, the area is still visited today by the remaining surviving members who once trained here for the combat in World War II. Additionally, Machine Gun Ridge and Ptarmigan Pass area, Ptarmigan Hill, were the Alpine training grounds for the 10th Mountain Division. And that legacy continues today with the potential for unexploded ordnance, the occasional sea ration container, and military tributes and replications that often take place in the area. We see a, a group called the Weasels. They show up once a winter and they use antique military motorized equipment to hybrid ski, just like the brand new Polaris and Articats. It's fantastic when they're there. Today's legacy of the 10th Mountain Division is our world-class hut system here in Colorado, which pays tribute to those who trained in Colorado, fought in Europe, and then came home to ski again in Colorado. Vail Pass holds four 10th Mountain Huts, as I've mentioned. Fowler Hillard, Jackal Hut, Janet's Cabin, and there's actually four huts over at Shrine Mountain. For those of you interested in the Vail Pass snowpack, the alpine terrain and snowpack of Vail Pass is one of the last spots where winter could be a reality moving forward if climatic models are to hold true right now. The 30-year average for Vail ski area is about 360 inches per winter. The 30-year average for Copper Mountain is about 305 inches. I would consistently measure approaching 400 inches a winter at Vail Pass. And that's non-scientific because I had a lot of other things to do. The geographic location of the VPWRA allows the area to benefit from weather patterns from southwest through northwest flow, though not every storm in Colorado impacts the area. The area typically holds snow through June, with motorized over snow vehicles being allowed November 16th to May 20th as the White River has made the determination to define the dates of the winter season in their, with their winter travel plan. 2010-11 was probably one of the best winters that I experienced at the Vail Pass Winter Wreck area. It was unprecedented, the amount of snow we had, and I think my back still hurts from that winter. The true legacy of the Vail Pass Winter Recreation Area is trying to find solutions to skiers and snowmobilers competing for the same terrain and for the same untracked powder. Vail Pass is one of the first places to get stakeholders together to agree to a map and also to embrace US management, USFS management with user fees. Nowhere else in Colorado, well, Granby, Grand Lakes, I believe, also has some user fees, but um, it's pretty rare in this part of the country. In the beginning, the winter recreation of Vail Pass began with leather-booted telemark skiers parking adjacent to I-70 and climbing Black Lakes Ridge for the earliest version of powder laps. Then snowmobiles arrived and were able to operate on packed snow and roadways. In the early 80s, a gentleman by the name of Phil Houghton claims to be the first person to drive a snowcat to Ptarmigan Hill where the best Vail Pass ski terrain exists, in my opinion. For almost 10 years, a cat skiing operation and private snow cats had almost exclusive use of this alpine terrain. Then as snowmobile technology improved and population boom on Colorado's front range got going, the area became very busy with snowmobiles. 
Today, the hybrid user group is the fastest growing user group with each snowmobile towing one to four friends out for a day of powder laps and terrain managed specifically for that purpose. At the same time as hybrid skiing becomes more popular in the area, the winter backcountry huts are filled to capacity almost every night of the winter season. The history of skiing and snowboarding in this terrain drove the establishment of the non-motorized ski zones and continues today in the practice of riding powder with motorized assistance to obtain the ridgeline. This legacy of shared use of terrain has been supported by the U.S. Forest Service through on-the-ground management and having a uniformed presence in the area as well as continuing to work with and implement management recommendations from the Vail Pass Task Force. Ultimately, the boundaries of Vail Pass and the motorized versus non-motorized composition of the area was decided when Paul Summer of the White River National Forest closed the stakeholders in a room and told them to work out the final details of the winter travel map. And if they emerged from the room with anything undecided, the unfortunate news was that the Forest Service would decide those final conclusions on those boundary designations. This, produ this approach produced the Vail Pass map that was mutually agreed upon by all stakeholders involved and for the most part is still the map that we implement today in the area. You can observe the winter recreation patterns that were created by the winter travel map and the implementation of it. When you look at these images, one is uh, a map image, the second is a Google Earth image produced by a wildlife study in the mid-2000s where the U.S. Forest Service and the University of Montana, they put GPS trackers on lynx and then they put GPS trackers on people. And we asked everybody to put a, a map, put a track on the map for us and let us know what type of user they were and that gave us an idea of what people were doing in our area, even when we weren't looking. What we found was that for the most part, people were using the area as we had intended and boundaries were being upheld and respected. This exercise illustrates that our users were generally using the area as it was set up. The Vail Pass Winter Recreation Area has a major benefit in having boots on the ground with snow rangers. The area is able to use signage and orange poles to create visual barriers, and also the paid snow rangers are able to provide law enforcement by issuing viola violation notices with associated fines when necessary. Not always. More importantly, Having a staff of snow rangers to steward the area is good for education. From parking lot management to spot discussions in the backcountry about etiquette of how to use the groom system with other users that might not be like yourself. Snow rangers can make a dent when it comes to getting people on the same page in recreation in the winter backcountry. But the costs for a crew of snow ranger can be very high, especially when you're already paying for snow plowing and grooming. The first complication of having a backcountry snow ranger to implement your area is it is not safe to work alone in the winter backcountry. So right off the bat, you have to have two of them. Additionally, the reality of injuries and the long winter season can be challenging for a small staff working in winter alpine conditions. So in my experience, it takes about three paid staff and four to five dedicated volunteers to have an effect on 55,000 acres. This comes at a cost of almost $200,000 per winter. And that doesn't include your grooming. As the Gunnison community begins to work together on a winter travel plan, the Vail Pass model is certainly worthy of your consideration. 
please keep in mind as you move forward with your discussion that grooming, snow cats, parking lot snow plows, parking lot management, and backcountry snow rangers are expensive yet effective ways to manage winter recreation. The reality is, is that this funding will fluctuate over the years, forever into the future. It'll be based on a variety, the funding will be based on a variety of factors, primarily the snow, which we all know is becoming a less certain reality in our future. It's best to manage away from the costs of these type of operations. My challenge is for you to design effective boundaries that don't need signage or snow rangers to enforce them. Terrain, vegetation, snowpack in specific locations will be vital to creating a map and boundaries that are obvious and mutually agreed upon by motorized and non-motorized users. Every time it snows, I had to go move this fence. <laughs> I loved it, it was job security, but for the average winter user who's already really committed to their machine and their skis, this is one more cost. In my opinion, it's of the utmost importance for stakeholders to visit these type of locations together in the winter when there's snow on the ground, to discuss concerns and exchange your perspectives face to face. This dialogue and mutual understanding will create a legacy that benefits winter recreation without creating situations where it's expensive to manage into the future. If there are areas where it is inevitable that different groups of winter users will be competing for the same terrain, like a Vail Pass. First, develop solutions that don't cost money. Find a way to do this without an overhead cost. But if you need to make an investment in winter recreation, in the experience that you want to have in the winter backcountry, the Vail Pass example suggests strategies that will take people to implement, it'll take people to maintain, and it'll take people to educate your users how to use this system. In conclusion, I personally thank you for your time and efforts in working as a local community to initiate and develop this conversation about the winter travel in your backcountry. Though I don't work directly with winter recreation at this time in my career, well, I work on the periphery of it, I hope to continue to be a winter recreation resource to anyone who wants to talk on this topic. I wish you good luck as you move forward as a community, and let it snow. Thanks.